Victory is celebrated in the light, but it is won in the darkness, a key element of what the sisterhood believes leads to the betterment of the Imperium. Man, I am beyond excited to begin my coverage of being back in this world that I'm beyond a fan of, and that is the world of Dune. Now this video will serve as a scene by scene breakdown of Dune Prophecy Episode 1 titled The Hidden Hand. Now before we get started, I want to establish a baseline of what you all should expect from this video. Now I'm coming into this show as someone who loves both films directed by Denis Villeneuve and I love the world that Frank Herbert has created and I'm very aware of its influence on the sci-fi genre as a whole. Now I've also seen the David Lynch film and I appreciate that film for what it is, but I say all that to say I have not read any of the books at all and I'm aware of some of the more trippy elements that come from the books and also know some of the future storylines that happens in the books, but by no means will I call myself an expert when it comes to the overall world of Dune. So this breakdown is coming from a fan of the films with little to no knowledge of the book so please don't expect me to call out all the different easter eggs or diving deeper into the story history books of this world. So this breakdown is coming from the perspective of someone looking at the characters, sharing my thoughts on the writing and basing my opinions or theories on what the show gives us. So there will not be any book spoilers for me by all means you all can share your thoughts if you have read the books to kind of give us like what we can expect with this series but again all of my opinions and my thoughts and my theories will be solely based on the individual episodes that are given to us now with that beyond the way let's talk about this episode and get into my breakdown full spoilers ahead as we flash back to a time when humans defeated the thinking machines and it was said that an atreides led them to victory when the war ended we hear that the harkonnens were banished for being cowards and sent to a desolate world as we are introduced to Valya Harkonnen who sets her sights on changing the history books that apparently the Atreides lied about. Now going back to my fandom of the movies, it is very apparent that the Harkonnens and the Atreides have been mortal enemies for centuries and it will be very interesting to get this series from a Harkonnen point of view. I also have to point out that Mass Effect slash Halo opening battle that we got there, am I the only person that would be interested in seeing like another spinoff series or maybe even a movie about the rise of the thinking machines and seeing the lead up to the battle and see if it was indeed an Atreides that did win the war. Now instead of being beholden by the shaman of her family's name, we see that Valya Harkonnen chose a new family made up of women unafraid of their powers. As we meet our first mother superior by the name of Ray Kella, who was a war hero who taught the sisters to work as truth sayers as they would be assigned to the great houses to help sift the truth from the lies. Now based on the trailers I guess I was under the assumption that we were going to be seeing like the very true beginnings of the sisterhood but as is shown in this scene they were already undergoing their practices. Again it seems like the time before the war and during the war and meeting and learning about characters like Ray Kella seems like a show within itself that could maybe be explored at a later point in time. After seeing the flaws of these people in power, we see to combat this, the Mother Superior secretly created this project to breed better leaders and foster the right royal unions to cultivate leaders that they can control, which is obviously something that we saw in the Dune movies. Now some of the sisters disagree with this method and we see that this decision created a divide amongst the sisters as we later see that some felt that this went against their values and their beliefs. On the home planet of the sisterhood, we see that the Mother Superior is on her deathbed and she's seeking to speak with Valia. Now after the room was cleared, we see that the sister mother speaks about this red dust and that this Terran Arafel is coming. Now after briefly looking this up, it appears that this is a cloud of darkness of holy judgment or a cloud of darkness at the end of the universe and it is the end of mankind which is something that we see in the vision throughout this episode. Now again, knowing the very little that I know that is coming in Doom Messiah, I would wonder if the reckoning is what's to come with Paul Atreides becoming the Emperor. Now I wonder if the show is introducing this concept in the series which again I know this concept comes from the books but I wonder for those that haven't read the books like myself if this does happen in the movies like a Doom Messiah or maybe another Doom story the audience will have a sense of the concept to better understand it now versus it being introduced in the film and people might be being confused on what it actually means. Now in this reckoning we see a sandworm arriving to eat whatever stands in its way we see shots of blood we see burnt bodies and we see the vastness in space and there's this blue light that 
that appears to be speaking. After this vision, we see that Valia is told to grow the sisterhood, safeguarding the powers, and to use every tool, or else they will fall, and she will be the one to see the burning truth and know. Now, it's important to remember the word burning that she spoke of, because later in this episode, we see two characters die after being burned alive, and that appears to be from the vision. Now, we see that Valia discusses this prophecy with the other sisters, and they describe it as a holy judgment brought down by a tyrant. Again, will the same prophecy come true with Paul Atreides? Now, to prevent this reckoning from happening, we see that Valia suggests that they put one of their own, a sister on the throne, to become the first empress to rule the Imperium. Now, at the superior mother's burial, we see the sisterhood beginning to take sides on what they believe their future is going to look like. We see that Mother Dotea seeks to put an end to the breeding project to bring back the values of the sisterhood. Now, Valia is ultimately chosen to lead the sisterhood after superior mother's death, but Mother Dotea is determined to end this project, but Valia stops her by using a voice on her for the very first time, a skill that she says that she's been working on and she wants to share with her at a later time, and she promises to continue to show her these skills if she bends the knee to her. Now, Mother Dortea refuses, which leads to Vanya forcing her to take her own life, as she says, sisterhood above all. Now, of course, based on the trailer, I'm to assume that we're going to get more scenes of young Valia, especially to see how she came to learn of the voice and where the power actually stems from, because we don't see anyone else using it for the rest of the episode. Now, to speak briefly to these opening sequences, there was a lot to take in, but it's pretty easy enough to follow along to understand what was established. There is a reckoning coming, and our lead character, Valia, believes that she is the one that can prevent this from happening and protect her sisterhood, but after killing one of her own, it seems that her own aspirations will come before her sisterhood, which in my opinion could lead to this iteration of sisterhood meeting their demise. Now we flash forward 30 years later from the opening scene and 116 years after the Great Machine War and over 10,000 years before Paul Atreides is born as we see this new era led by the mother superior Valia. Now we see under her guidance, she's the one who decides which sisters are chosen to be truth sayers for the royal families. Now interesting enough, we see that she declines her own family's name after they requested a sister for the fourth time. Now later on in this episode, we actually see a Harkonnen, but they don't seem nearly as powerful nor as menacing as we've seen them in the films, so it seems that she may have disowned like a section of her family because they lack power or respect from the great houses, and maybe to some, they're still considered to be cowards after being banished after the war won against the thinking machines. Now we see the sisters in training see the princess's half-brother Constantine, and we learn that he has no claim to the throne as he's here to finalize the decision on if the princess will be allowed to learn the ways of the sisterhood and become a truth sayer for the next 10 years. Now obviously this harkens back to the plan that was created on the night of the superior mother's death and that's having one of their own on the golden iron throne. Now the princess will not be given any special privileges after Constantine tries to like half-heartedly demand that she have her own quarters, but it gets declined, but this doesn't change anything because we see this meeting doesn't last too much longer as it is confirmed that she will be joining the sisterhood in about a week or so. Now personally, I don't think sending Constantine here was meant as a sign of him being taken seriously or him actually making demands, but I believe whether it was his father or his mother, I think they just want him to make something of himself. They want him to be taken seriously to a certain extent and they want him to have purpose because it's never explained if he was born of wedlock or if the emperor or the empress had an affair out of marriage and he's looked at as like a bastard child which explains why he doesn't have a claim to the throne. Now we get this quick scene that shows the differences of opinion between the two sisters, Valia and her younger sister, Tula, as they're showing the trainees this reading and knowing how to tell the difference between the lies and how they can take advantage of lies, which throughout this episode, we see that Tula is pushing back against her sister at points, not to like a strong degree, but enough to know that there is some disagreements that they have and they've had since they were probably kids and to me this points out a future storyline of their relationship slowly becoming more and more complicated. Now from here we venture off into the planet Seleucia Secundus which is the home world of the Imperial House. Here's where we officially meet the princess who's training with Kirin who is the sword master as the princess shows Constantine the skills she's learned so far. 
Meanwhile, we're introduced to Emperor Carino, who's conducting a marriage arrangement between his daughter Nez and House Roshani's nine-year-old son. Now, this marriage is believed to strengthen the Imperium as they're gifted a new fleet that will deal with the issues on Arrakis, which involves stealing of the spice imports. Now, during this conversation, we see that the sisters are at work because these two leaders of their respective houses, including the Emperor himself, think that they are in control of this situation as they're going back and forth with the details, but we see that the two sisters that represent their houses are the actual ones brokering this arrangement and controlling this situation as the marriage is agreed upon. Now, we see that the Empress is not fond of her daughter becoming a sister, nor is she happy with this arrangement of marriage. Now, on the other hand, we see that Nez is very happy with this arrangement because of the young age of her husband allows her to be in control. While he's aging up, she'll be able to keep her secret relationship going on with the Swordmaster. Which, speaking of, we see that the Swordmaster Karen telling the Emperor of the arrival of a soldier who survived a recent attack on Arrakis by the name of Desmond Hart. And we learn that he's a decorated soldier who's here to tell the truth about why he's the sole survivor of the attack. Now he informs the Emperor that the Fremen weren't responsible for wiping out his regiment and instilling the spice, but instead claims that it came from these insurgents from their allied worlds trained in their ways. Now Kesha, who serves as the Emperor Truthsayer, she uses her abilities and tells the Emperors that the story is true, or at least that he believes it to be true. A heart gets granted access to stay for a little bit longer and gets invited to the party that's going to be taking place later that night as Kesha senses something after meeting Hart. Now it appears that Hart's arrival caused some type of distress or disruption because Kesha feels some sense of presence. As we see Kesha having a vision which sees the princess above her in the mouth of a sandworm and wearing a red dress with blood trailing after her and we see this rotten fruit and she's blaming Kesha as she gets consumed by the sandworm and that same blue light from the superior mother's visions comes back up in this vision as well. As it seems that the marriage is forbidden or at the very least is the beginning of the reckoning. Now we only get one actual scene between Kesha and Nez, but it's very clear that Kesha cares for her and she says her goodbyes as this will be the last time they actually speak and she gives her a kiss on the forehead. I don't think Kesha knew that this was going to be the last time she was going to speak to the Princess Nez, but I do definitely think that she knew that if she didn't stop this marriage from happening, that something bad was going to come from those nightmares, and she tries to prevent this from happening and keeping Nez safe at the same time, which obviously contradicts the plan that the sisterhoods have. Now, the only scene that we get between husband and wife, the Empress and the Emperor, again, we learn that she is not pleased with this wedding, that she's also not a fan of the sisterhood, and she mentions that their marriage hasn't been as strong after the emperor start taking advice from the sisterhood and wasn't listening to her so it's very clear that there is a history there and i'm really excited to kind of explore that history again what's the deal with constantine was that a bastard kid and i'm just really excited to see when did the, the rift happen between these two when did the sisterhood get advised to the emperor and what did change in their relationship something again that i'm excited to explore more of now back on the home world of the sisterhood, we witness them in training and we see them in combat, them in rain, testing their strength and weaknesses. We also see them practicing their truth saying abilities against criminals. And again, the show puts an emphasis on this particular sister, Lila. Now in the combat scenes, we also see that she's not as strong as the others. For example, we meet Jen, who seems to be skilled in combat. And she may be a good liar as well, as she tells this story that we later find out wasn't entirely true about her past as a child. But again, I see the show show setting up both characters in this particular scene as important characters moving forward in the overall story. Now we see Valia and her sister Tula looking over candidates to pair with the princess on her training. They want someone that they can trust but more importantly someone they can keep in line. Now we see both sisters have their own favorites within their sisterhood and again we see that sister Layla comes up and Valia believes that she's a lamb lost in the woods. Now Tula mentions because of her family lineage that she is a natural truth sayer but Valia again and sees her as only being weak. Again, they definitely seem to be setting up Lila as someone to emerge as a key character to be the opposite of what she's looked at, which is being weak. Now, Sister Kesha arrives and shares her recent nightmare and expresses her concerns about Nez joining the sisterhood. It's in this scene that we see just how much they scheme as we learn that the attacks on Arrakis were coordinated by the sisters as a part of their plan to arrange this marriage. As this decade-long plan that Kesha believes may be the path to the reckoning that they fear is coming, is just dismissed by Valia as she stands behind her decision for this wedding to proceed. 
Now, not much later after their conversation with Kesha, we see that Tula speaks to her concerns and convinces her sisters to recheck the breeding process to confirm that they've made the right choice in choosing Nez. Meanwhile, during that conversation, we meet young Lord Pruitt, who meets the Emperor as the pre-wedding rituals commence. Now, in this scene, we see Nez and the red dress from Kesha's nightmare. We also see the fruit being eaten, again, remembering this was rotten in the dream, and it stands as a sign leading to what's a bad omen, in my opinion, pointing towards death. Now after the ceremony, we see a Baron Harkonnen trying to convince the Emperor to buy new well fur to add to his material of his outfits. To me, this just points out the fact that the Harkonnens may have been overlooked during this time period and have come a very long way from when we meet them in the future in the movies, from selling fur to later generations influence the Emperor and being one of the most powerful families in the universe. Now it seems that the young Lord Hewitt isn't all that excited about his newly appointed wife as he seems a little bit standoffish towards her. Now, Nez senses that something is bothering him and he's being somewhat deceitful as she asks to see what is going on with him as this leads to him accidentally letting loose his pet tech lizard, which causes a reaction from the crowd because this technology is forbidden. Now, the Empress is beyond upset and looks for the Emperor to take her side and take action, but he doesn't and allows this to be overlooked, which comes to a surprise to the audience and more importantly, his wife. Which to me, this is basically illuminates the idea that people do not really trust the decisions that the Emperor makes, but also, again, his wife and him are not on the same page. Now we see that Valia reassures her younger sister that the plan is still intact and Nez is indeed the right one to carry on the breeding project against Kesha's nightmare. Now I personally don't think Valia actually really took her time to reconsider the decision, but she pretended to do so to entertain her sister's concerns. Now it's also in this moment that we see some of the sisters in training aren't necessarily excited about the arrival of of the princess entering the sisterhood without going through the proper training process, which to me is kind of setting up this plot where I can see her arriving and the princess not getting along with some of the sisterhoods and maybe they're even picking on her, which can lead to Nez and Lila becoming friends. Now after the commotion with the tech lizard, we see Hart speaking with the emperor about his concerns about what's outside of the walls and what people are saying about the emperor, and many question his decisions being made and they believe that maybe banning the machines was a mistake, but also putting to question why only the great houses profit from the spice. Now, Hart continues by sharing his beliefs with the Emperor, which are beyond man and machine. He claims that there were forces involved that kept him alive during the attacks on Arrakis. He implies that the gods are listening as the Emperor responds by making a remark that if the gods are real, they'll relieve him of the wedding that is stressing him out, but again, he has to go through it to get the fleet that he was promised. In my eyes, this interaction between these two show that Hart clearly has his own motives and he's trying to get into the Emperor's ear and trying to make him abandon his faith and loyalty to the sisterhood. We end this episode with the princess and her brother going to celebrate the division at this nightclub before her marriage. It's here that we learn that Kieran is actually in Atreides and him and the princess engage in more intimate activities this time around before her marriage is official. Now in the scene, we see the bartender who has blue eyes like a Fremen, so I'm pretty confident that she is a Fremen. She seemed to be very uncomfortable with the hooking up of the princess and the Swordsmaster, so I think that this is definitely shaping up some type of love triangle between the three different characters. I can see if this relationship continues that maybe the princess gets pregnant with his child and that's going to be looked down on upon from the other houses and the sword master might get punished from engaging in these affairs with the princess either way i don't see this relationship ending up well our final moments show the emperor awaking from his sleep to rewatch the footage from the moment that Hart stood as the only survivor as a sandworm approaches him and he survives the attack now this was cut between Hart finding the young lord in the halls because he couldn't sleep as well as Hart shares his thoughts about the control repeating itself like the machines had over the humans and compares this to the control that the sisters have over them as he shows his powers to the young lord as he begins to panic and his skin starts to burn and he dies. Now I couldn't tell if Hart was like physically doing this with his mind or if he poisoned his toy or something that he touched to poison him. Either way, it's clear from the footage and also the scene that he's capable of powers beyond man. As we cut to screams of Kesha whose skin is also burning at the same time as the young lord's death, which is also a part of her nightmares as the vision would show people burnt and it seems that the dream is coming true. As Valia sees this and says that she sees the Mother Superior and we end with the vastness of space yet again but this time around we don't see that blue light speaking. 
Now, my immediate question that I have is why and how are what's happened to both Kesha and Puret are connected? Only thing I can think of right now is that they were both in physical contact with Nez and maybe she's the literal and physical manifestation of the reckoning that the sisters fear. Or we gotta remember that both characters were in close proximity with Hart and maybe he used whatever powers he had to kill both of those characters. Now after that ending, the wedding clearly isn't happening and puts a big damper on the plans of the sisters, but also this may create tension between the houses because maybe they believe that the emperor or the royal family had something to do with the young lord's death. But another question I have is, what does this mean for Nez? Will she be allowed to go to her training and what will she do after learning what happened to Kesha? Now speaking of Kesha, her death leads the emperor without a truth sayer, so will she be replaced? Will this be Hart's opportunity to be the advisor he wants to be? Or will this put more pressure on Nez to become a sister to aid her father? Now it definitely seems like the show is setting up the story that's going to be leading towards this inevitable reckoning from the visions from the mother Raquel as well as Kesha, but I would assume that Valya will do what she can to prevent this from happening, or we will see how her aspirations and blindness to the truth will cause this destruction. If Nez ends up on the throne as part of Valya's plans, this seems to be the cause of the doom that's to come by having a sister on the Golden Iron Throne. Now we clearly know that the sisterhood does survive, but I guess the question is, how will they survive or does a reset of new leadership emerge from the ashes after failure of misjudgment of Valia? I can also see the two sisters, Valia and her younger sister Tula, coming to the conclusion where one of them was going to betray one another and this might lead to Tulia ending up on top and finally being in control of her sister who based on this episode has always been the one to take charge and Tula always seems to follow her orders. But overall, I thought this premiere episode showed promise. I thought the overall production design fit in the world of Dune, which I like, but also has its own distinct enough style to establish that this was a different time frame than what we've seen in the films. Now, one of my favorite elements of the Dune movies is the visual representation and also the cinematography by Greg Frazier and this wasn't as jaw-dropping from like a visual standpoint but it's its own style and overall aesthetic that can work with the overall telling of the story in its own unique way. I thought the score of the show was solid which again I love the score from Hans Zimmer but speaking to the overall performances I thought that some of them were a little bit generic but that's because we didn't spend too much time with all the characters especially the supporting characters for example the sisters in training but rather it be characters like the emperor or the overall royal family i thought they were fine even the main characters like vanya and her sister were fine as well but the most interesting characters so far after this first episode to me was nez and hart they both have a bit of intrigue going on like Hart we have the whole mystery of what he's capable of and if he has powers and of course you have Nez who's being positioned as essentially the show's version of Paul Atreides. Again I wouldn't say I was blown away by the premiere but I also thought it was a lot better of what I heard from people that had seen it before I did. Speaking of I've spoken to people that have seen the first four episodes and they said that it gets better as it goes along which to me is very promising to hear. So before I wrap up, please leave your thoughts and opinions and theories and deeper meanings that you all took away from this premiere episode in the comments below. Now, I plan to cover this every single Sunday, and if that's something you all want to see me do, please show me by liking this video, sharing this video, and consider sticking around by subscribing to the channel. Don't forget, you all are awesome, stay safe, and I'll catch you all on the next breakdown.